Welcome to Second Opinion, the review show here on the Nexus. I'm your host, Ian R. Buck. And I am also your host, Ian R. Buck. JK, it's Brian and Brandon. And we're taking over the show today. We'll be talking about iOS 12, uh, and we've got a great show for you. You can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash SO49 if you would like to follow along. Sweet. Without further ado, let's dive in. So iOS 12 um, is uh, kind of been eagerly awaited by a lot of folks since its announce, uh, announcement on uh, earlier this summer at WWDC, um, but it's not going to be released until September 17th, which, uh, as, as we record, uh, is just a couple days out here. Yeah, um, and this is a kind of fir- a first for an iOS version is that it will support devices from... 2013 so what is that like five years back um so it's it runs on the iphone 5s and newer and the ipad air and newer so it's like every 64-bit ios device right yeah it's uh i saw a chart on twitter yesterday that was showing the timelines of um iphones being released and what and you know how many years of ios support they have and from the iphone 5s and newer it's like every every couple of years they just add another year onto it because the first couple of iphones only worked for two years so the first iphone ran iphone os1 iphone os2 and iphone os3 and then the i think the same with the 3g the 3gs ran ios 4 but the iphone 4 ran through ios 7 so it got three years out of that and it just kind of got longer and longer but yeah i think it's totally the 64-bit um, and i think that's kind of about the time when the cpus really started getting fast you know you could double them and so after many years of doubling performance it's enough to to still run a modern OS on. Yeah, that's that's pretty awesome. And like I've I've always kind of joked that um if if, if I were smart ahead of every um ahead of the next Apple event that iPhones were rumored to be released, I'd just sell my previous phone <laughs> so that I'd get hopefully a slightly better uh, return on on the sale and just like swap back to the 5S before just just to wait until the the new the new phones come out. Um, I've never actually done that because it's a little bit too devious for for me to f- figure out, and that's a lot of thinking that goes in, into it. And, and a five S would probably be pretty slow, but it's really cool to see that, like, um, you know, now I can stick around, for example, with my with my iPhone seven for possibly up to another year, and probably won't feel extremely limited by that. Like the battery has gone downhill quite a, quite a ways, but um, I, I can resolve that through outside means. It's awesome to see that Apple's kind of um, maybe giving those devices a little bit more longevity, um, despite kind of the countervailing narrative that you know uh, companies like Apple and Apple in particular kind of people sometimes tend to say that they have a bit of planned obsolescence built in. Um, and this is kind of something that maybe counteracts that perhaps a little. Yeah, I would say you know people are always those who don't follow tech are like the new iPhone already, but you know it's it's every year. And um, and really, you know, I, iPhones these days will have the will run the latest software for over twice as long as any Android phone you can buy. Um, and so, I think Apple's really done a good job of fighting the plan obsolescence. And um, sure, maybe some of the features are a little different, and performance will be a little worse. But I think it's it's fantastic. You can still have an iPhone from 2013 running the latest version of. The OS. Right. I remember from for like the when I used to have an iPhone four, um, that was like a big motivator for me to switch because like at a certain point that you know, uh, as as somebody who who works with software in particular with iPhones, like I can't be working off of something that doesn't have the latest software. Like um, I would have no clients, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's it's cool to see. Well, I just remember like. When I got the iPhone 4 to the iPhone 5, I'm like, oh, it's so much faster. This is great. And then um, my mom had the iPhone 4 for four years, and she really needed to upgrade after those four years, and she has the iPhone 6. But she's going to have the iPhone 6 for five years now. So it's, you know, it's it's, it's okay. It still runs the latest software version by an entire model of iPhone. Seriously. That's awesome. We've been kind of hinting at this performance thing here. Um, So for some numbers for you... um, Apple tells, I think they ran all these tests on an iPhone 6 Plus. Um, so up to 70% faster swipe to camera, so from the lock screen, up to 50% faster keyboard display, so when you bring up the keyboard and, and enter in a text field, 
up to two times faster app launch under heavy workload, up to two times faster share sheet display under load. And just in general, I think there are smoother animations and they've really tuned that kind of framework of the OS. Totally. And I think, you know, a, a lot of what this can kind of speak to as, as well, right, is now that um, Apple's kind of all under that same um, 64-bit ARM platform um, and, and kind of some other kind of architectural changes changes along with, with that, um, there's kind of a little bit of hardware uh, uh, homogeneity that helps, like, then focus on making these improvements. They no longer have to worry about, like, um, differences in hardware and, and even in some cases like platform level differences that could cause them or prevent them from using things like metal APIs or um, stuff like that for animations and for f- f- like just faster paint on screen um, and I, I think iOS 11 kind of had some of that but it's awesome to see a lot of that come to fruition it feels like in iOS 12 for sure totally so another new feature of iOS 12 is group FaceTime with the asterisk that it's coming later this fall it was in the earlier iOS 12 betas this summer, but then they removed it. Um, but when it is released, we'll just kind of briefly cover it because it's not out yet. But um, you can have support up to 32 people. Um, there are tons of real-time effects. Um, so like Animoji and filters and Memoji and text effects and shapes. Um, and, it'll, and you can have it focus on whoever is speaking. Um, you can do video on the iPhone, iPad, and Mac. And you can do audio only form on the Apple Watch and HomePod. And so you can mix the video and audio together. And, of course, it's end-to-end encrypted. It's pretty awesome. Um, I'm not a huge FaceTime user. Um, I, you know, uh, a lot of work takes place over, like, Hangouts and Google Meet um, and sometimes Slack calls. But uh, I think that for a lot of folks uh, I know who do use FaceTime a lot more frequently, I think this will be pretty uh, pretty neat and might even convince me to start using FaceTime for, uh, for kind of personal calls, which like I never have, (laughs) right? But if I did, that'd probably be what I'd reach for. Occasionally I'll feel extra DVS and be like, you know, I'm going to call them with FaceTime audio, just see what's up. And then, you know, it has a different ringer. The the sound quality is way higher than over cellular. It's just kind of interesting to do it that way. Yeah, absolutely. Some other changes that have come through, uh, particularly uh, to do with messages. Um, So, uh, of course, kind of the one that got the most... uh, press after WWDC was Memoji, the kind of Bitmoji, um, you know, Apple kind of Sherlocked Bitmoji a little bit there, copied a little bit of what they were after by creating, allowing you to create kind of like a, um, a caricature or like animated representation of, of yourself that reacts kind of like an animoji would. Um, but only if you have a phone that's fancy enough to have one of those true depth sensors. Uh, so that's going to be the iPhone 10 and of course the 10s, 10s Max, and the 10R. Does the 10R have the sensor array? It does, doesn't it, right? Yep. Okay. Um, now, I actually think you don't need that sensor to do this. Really? But they locked it to these phones just because, you know, software-enabled feature for a specific phone. Huh. I, I, I thought for sure it had something to do with the with the depth sensor, but um, that's actually in retrospect. I think that's the assumption. That's how they can get away with it. Yeah. I think someone was doing some... I think Steve Charton Smith was doing some spelunking and and saw that no, you don't really need that. It's like similar to the iPhone four didn't or sorry the iPhone three G S and some of the older iPad touches couldn't do home screen wallpapers. But if well, I was jailbroken at the time. You just go to the like a basically an OS settings file for all these st- st- uh, specific features, and you can just enable wallpaper, and then it's there, and it's super easy. And it totally worked on the iPhone 3GS, but it was, you know, it's probably reducing performance more so than they want, but it might also be a, let's encourage people to buy the newer one. So it's maybe a combination of the two of those. That's fair. That's fair. So like I, I built a, a feature um, at one point that was very similar to Memoji. Um, I guess maybe not similar in, in the sense of like it had the same, it, it used the same sort of um Techniques, but um, it used Apple's Vision Framework, which is like an ML-assisted way to detect, um, for example, faces and facial landmarks, um, and you could like attach 3D objects to that, and that was all well and good. Um, but I did see that, like, even just using that, it, it had some kind of performance stuff associated with it that made it a little bit a, a little bit slow. So I wouldn't guess if there was something that did kind of link it to hardware too. Um, but, and, you know, like as soon as you had the depth sensor activated, you could get much higher quality, um, like 
depth data for that that made that feature work a lot better. But I unfortunately didn't get the chance to work on it. <laughs> it could totally just be an enhancement on what the camera alone can do. So. Absolutely. Um, I do think the emojis are pretty cool because they are taking a bunch of, you know, just common 3D objects and stacking them on top of each other. I don't think there's even a difference between like male and female. They're all the same. It's just whatever features you put on and how you control it. There's no like, these are all the the hairstyles for women and these are all the ones for men. No, they're they're all the same and it just it's really however you want to shape a a base humanoid looking face. Pretty cool. Thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, along with that, uh, it looks like uh, there's some new Animoji as well. Um, again, that's and that's kind of newer. Uh, looks like you get a koala, a tiger, a ghost, uh, or a T-Rex. That's pretty cute. Um, there's some detection. Oh yeah, this is kind of the killer, the killer feature, the thing that I think um, I was really excited about because I like the thing that I was building had tongue detection and wink detection, and those can be really hard to dial in, um, especially because um, there are uh, like uh, individual and group differences in like the the way that like tongue landmarks and eye landmarks work. But tongue and wink detection is um, is kind of a new thing for Animoji and Memoji that allows, like, if when it works well, it really, especially with, like, kids, it makes people just, like, flip out. When you see, when you see like, a, you know, you stick your tongue out and your little animated character does, does the same. Um, those animations are really something else pretty cute. It just makes sense because now this Animoji or Memoji is just truly replicating what you're doing. And it's, it's, it's really fun. In addition to that, uh, Messages is getting some new um, filters uh, and text effects for uh, for like. Uh, actually, I'm not I'm not sure what those are. Those are. Did you did you do you remember do you remember anything about that? I think some of them are how you're like sending text. You know those special effects when you send a message. Oh right right right. So these are these are also in group FaceTime. So I think they're kind of related. They're probably the same private framework in the in the OS. But yeah, it's just embedding shapes. I think some of it's on top of images or videos as well. But you do that in the app of messages. Well, that does kind of lead us into the camera, where uh, a lot of software fixes are kind of uh, coming across in iOS 12, including improved lighting for por- portrait mode and portman- uh, portrait segmentation API. I almost called it a portmanteau API. That would be cool. Um, <laughs> por- por- portmentation API? There we go. Uh, portrait segmentation and... And uh, an improved QR code reader, which actually, um, it's kind of funny. There was kind of much ado where uh, about a tool that I was using recently that was QR code activated. Apple had them remove the QR code portion from the app. So, like, you couldn't use an embedded QR code scanner for it. Um, and it was just, like, last week that I realized, oh, hey, the camera's a QR code reader, so I can scan the QR code with my camera, and it'll just use the same deep link that it would have anyway to, to, to make that work. So it's, it's cool to have that globally now. I can finally delete the QR code app that I've had on my phone for eight years. Right. Woot woot. Right. It feels good. Um, and that's another thing, too, that's, like, part of the vision framework. So it's cool to just see that stuff built into the camera. Along with that comes smart HDR on the iPhone XS, uh, HDR being high dynamic range, right? Yeah, they they take more pictures than they used to. I think they used to do three, one lower, the one you you take, and the one a little higher exposure. And then this one does like five or seven or, I don't know, way more. It just does a burst. And I think they're saying it does like a trillion operations when you take a photo. Wow. That's pretty goofy. That's pretty neat. Uh, You also get a dynamic bouquet after you take the photo, so give you that nice blur underneath it. Um, But, of course, that's going to be limited to the iPhone XS. And now, uh, we've, uh, anything else you want to say about the camera? I think it's time for you to let loose on ARKit 2. Alrighty. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm super excited about ARKit 2 uh, because it brings a lot of stuff that we've been really excited for, uh, particularly those of us who do in the AR space, um, that, that we've been kind of asking for for a while or looking for for a while, and brings a lot of simplification too, I think. Um, one thing that's really user, user-facing is the... Um, measure app so you might have seen a lot of early demos where folks could like um determine how like the dimensions of a space using an ar kit app um apple kind of sherlocked all those and now it's a now it's a first party thing um and it's it's you know it's kind of nice to have it in a, in a little utility there i haven't used that a ton but it's a user-facing thing that kind of came along with ar kit too 
Um, additionally, AR Kit 2 added, and this is something that I think is really cool, the ability to quick look AR objects. So you can um, basically activate a 3D object um, that somebody sent you on email or is embedded in a website um, and v either view it and manipulate it in, in the app itself or actually an AR, AR place around you. Now, like, to be honest, this kind of uh, negates or this kind of removes the need to make, like, I would say probably 80% of AR kit apps that exist today or 80% of AR kit implementations that exist in existing apps today. Like all of the Amazon stuff about how you like, oh, what does this lamp or this couch or this bookcase look like in my, in my house? Um, all you need to do is just package your 3D object just so, and Apple will handle the rest. And you can just activate it with that with pretty standard system controls, um, and it just feels really awesome. We did a, a little demo of that um, for uh, for a client recently, and I'm, I'm I'm super excited for it. Any situation where you just want to place a 3D object in the room with you, it's um it's really easy. And you can embed that in an app or like a web page. Yeah. And I think it is an open format. So other d devices and operating systems can implement this in the future too. And it's something of a cross-platform thing that um, is using these shared ideas around augmented reality. Yeah. I think that is, that's absolutely magnificent. I'm really excited for what we can do with that. Um, additionally, there are some improvements to vertical surface detection. A lot of the stuff isn't really like, um, Public, but this is like a, a felt sense and a thing that I've seen is, as I've been working with some AR kit stuff recently. AR has to help out a little bit with that, uh, even though we've seen vertical surface detection um, since AR kit 1.5. Um, they've just been fine tuning things, and that's been really clear uh, working with it. Um, 3D object recognition. So, this, I believe. So, um, the Apple thing, Apple Docs say AR kit 2 recognizes objects and how your device is oriented to them and can use that information to incorporate objects into AR experiences. Right, 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 right. So I think that would be, you know, if there's something on a plane, you can incorporate that into your scene. There we go. All right. Yeah, that's that's kind of a, uh, that's, that's a pretty big deal um, because the, you know, one of the biggest issues with AR Kit 1 is that, like, if you have something obstructing a plane, like if, if you have, like, a desk and it detects the desk, but there's a lamp on the desk, um, you want you want that that object to be kind of intelligently part of the detaining plane you don't want to like layer something and then and then it looks really weird because you know you have like your 3d object and then stick up sticking out it feels it feels a little bit uh, a little bit goofy so any, any kind of information or improvements around that are, are, is going to be really great um face tracking also came through with ar kit 2 and improvements uh there too that uh, particularly I think are improved by that true depth sensor on the tens and 10 S series. Um, and, uh, additionally, uh, another thing that I'm really excited about is the ability to persist, um, scene data. So like any of the detected planes that it finds, uh, and this kind of probably has to do with that 3d object recognition too, um, allowing you to save that so that if the app is backgrounded or closed, that data is still available to you when you relaunch the app. So like one of the biggest things that folks run into now or one of the biggest problems with AR apps is one, currently once you close them, anything that you've done, any planes that you've recognized, any objects you've placed, that's all gone. Um, with AR Kit 2, that will be, you'll have the opportunity to, to um, make that persistent, which is really great. If you want to learn more about uh, changes that came through in AR Kit 2 or that are coming uh, in iOS 12 uh, around multiplayer experiences, that um, uh, plane detection, persistence, scene reflection, face tracking, any of the stuff we've talked about. Unity has a really awesome uh, write-up. Um, so Unity, the folks who make the, the Unity engine that's used by a lot of ARKit apps, um, has a really awesome blog post about kind of what all these features are, but also what they kind of allow you to do, uh, particularly if you're using the Unity platform, but I think it's just a really good write-up in general. So we'll make sure that's in the show notes for you. Phew. Uh, yeah, any any more rambling you want to you want to hear about uh, AR Kit Two? <laughs> Sounds good to me. Uh, should we move on to screen time? Let's do it. So this uh, is a new kind of concept in iOS twelve that monitors how often you're using your phone. So it does things like activity reports. So it'll it'll gi it'll give you a report I think once a week saying how often you you have used apps of different categories. So social media or photography or games or productivity kind of. You know, the, I think it's probably the common app store category breakdowns. And so it'll tell you 
that information as well as how many times you've picked up your device a day. It'll tell you throughout the day when you picked it up more. So I see, oh, when I'm eating lunch, I pick up my phone way more than when I'm working, for example. And you can compare across devices. So every device on your iCloud account, you can see in one and you can see it aggregated by device or all of them combined together. Um, there's kid monitoring. So if you're in a family uh, household or a bunch of linked iCloud accounts, you can see um, how your kids are doing. Um, you can do app limits, so you can limit certain applications or categories to X amount of time per day, um, and then it'll warn you, and you can maybe bump 15 more minutes, or, or if you're being faithful, you can just say, okay, I actually won't check Twitter for the 200th time today. <laughs> uh, I have not enabled this, if you're wondering. I don't think I will. <laughs> um, there's also downtime, so something like a bedtime when apps and notifications are blocked and only the very important ones, and I think you might be able to set this a bit, will come through. So it's kind of meaning if you're waking up in the middle of the night and you check your phone, you won't see any no notifications there. So you're not going to be extra stressed out or anything. You'll just see the time. Yeah, totally. Um, I'm, I, when I first heard about this, I thought I would be a uh, kind of a heavier user of, of these features. But um, in the months that I've been using iOS 12 uh, on the dev builds, I, you know, I tried setting some boundaries for Instagram and Tweetbot, but for whatever reason, I never seemed to exceed them. So I just forgot that I even activated it whatsoever. Um, what were your What were your limits? You know, that's a good question. I should have looked those up before saying words about it. Let's see. The internet says, "Oh, look at that! This is my iPhone, not my child's iPhone. Looks like it is not active. So that would explain why <laughs> why uh, why it's not working. I must have it must have reset at some point." But I thought it was basically like, I think I said I wanted to do like no more than one hour of Instagram every day, which I guess maybe is a little bit too much, but I don't know. I like Instagram. It's, it's fun. It's where I put all my coffee pictures. You have good Instagram. Um, there was a beta earlier on where it reset all the screen time data and settings. So they kind of had to do a wipe and start over again. And that was probably when that happened. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Which explains why I never meet that limit, because I'm sure there, I'm sure there are days, especially when I've been traveling, that I spent way more than an hour on Instagram. So I guess uh, I guess I should revisit that a little bit. Um, downtime, I, I, as we discovered in the fringe, I've actually been using that unintentionally, uh, <laughs> basically all, all the time, because um, apparently downtime activates when you have when you're within the bedtime window. So like I usually set that every night. Um, and that that kind of activates the kind of um, notifications and calls and stuff from being hidden, which is actually really nice. I'm a, I'm a pretty big fan of that. Yeah, I definitely like that and use it too. Um, notifications, though, this is this is kind of interesting. So with iOS 12, we get uh, group notifications. So like uh, if an app notifies you multiple times, they'll all kind of collapse together into a stack, almost like a stack of cards, but allows you to either um, handle them as a group or handle them individually. Uh, there's a little bit of pri prioritization coming through with critical alerts. Um, does that kind of have to do with like uh, like the weather and amber alert sort of thing too, Brian? Let me... Let me do a find on the Apple page. Critical alerts. A new type of opt-in alert for important information like reports from my healthcare provider, which you'll receive even during Do Not Disturb. Right, right. That's that's kind of what I, what I was thinking too. Like if there's, if there's something kind of, uh, yeah, I guess critical is the best word, isn't it? If there's something important happening, that's, that's cool, but there's a way that you can kind of identify those and allow notification center to, to prioritize them. I bet it prioritizes it. And of course, it you know, blows through the Do Not Disturb or downtime right on modes as well makes sense um this does kind of bring me to something kind of weird that i noticed on earlier builds of ios 12 though um sometimes i just like i would go to where i thought notification center would be but it would just kind of be blank and i'm wondering kind of in retrospect whether that was do not disturb whether that was downtime um but it, it was just like blank no notification of, of what was going on uh but that's probably fixed now. It seems to be fixed now. And it could have just been me not knowing how to activate Notification Center, which is very possible. Yeah, I, d I did not see that, but I don't know. Maybe maybe there was a bug, but it, it might be fixed now. I haven't seen it at all. Yeah, we should probably just chalk that up to me being tired. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Do Not Disturb now kind of has a little bit better placement in Control Center, so it's easier to activate and deactivate. And you can kind of base it on locations, or time periods or something like that. So you can basically say, don't disturb me for an hour, so it'll activate D&D &D for an hour. Or um, 
you know, activate it until I leave this place, which actually is, you know, kind of great for me because sometimes I'll, I'll go, you know, go get lunch or coffee and I just like need to take a couple seconds to myself <laughs> and I can just kind of set it for, you know, uh, until I leave the coffee shop, don't ping me. Um, so that's, that's, that's pretty fun. Uh, it does a generally better job of just like keeping those notifications hidden from you on the lock screen in a notification center. Um, so that's probably actually what my problem was is that do not disturb or downtime was activated. Um, or maybe I was just not really sure how to activate notification center. Stranger things have happened, but those changes are all pretty positive. Uh, some other changes came through to photos. Um, and the, the, the thing that's annoyed me the most about these has to be um, photo sharing. So um, now in the iMessage app, um, or is it, is it still called iMessage or is it just called Messages now? It's just called Messages, isn't it? Messages. In the Messages app, um, it used to be that the photo icon was kind of given central placement and then all of your apps and sticker packs and stuff like that were hidden under the applications key. But now um, the photos icon is underneath the application key and there's just a camera button. So I always activate the camera thinking it'll take me to my, um, t take, take me to my photo library so I can share photos when in fact it just activates the camera. So I've taken a lot of pictures accidentally of my face looking surprised at not getting to the, <laughs> not getting to the right, uh, the right view that I was expecting. But I think this kind of has kind of a, a dual, uh, a dual purpose here. I think one thing is it kind of forces people to think about um, iMessage apps a little bit more because, you know, right now we don't have a ton of usage data on that, but um, the ones that I've seen aren't necessarily like people don't really use them very much. Um, I guess people is kind of broadly, and this is just like anecdotal, but it's like usage wise that they can be kind of tricky to track, um, which makes them kind of maybe not extremely. Uh, top of mind for folks and like seeing the photos app next to all these other things um the sticker packs the iMessage apps kind of causes you to think maybe about using them in ways that that I hadn't thought like I sent somebody Apple Pay cash at one point and that's underneath there too so it was, it was just kind of uh kind of weird how that works I'm, I'm interested in kind of what, what that is I think I use now now for the photos one Apple Pay uh Party parrots Hi. and gifs. There you go, party parrot. That's good. I I've used the music one sometimes from time to time, but not not very frequently. And like nobody else I know, other than you, maybe Brian, uh, subscribed to Apple Music. Do, do you yeah, subscribe to Apple Music? Of course, since day one. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. I love Apple Music. So like I keep sending people Apple Music links, and they're like, I can't listen to this. And I'm like, Well, I can't listen to your Spotify links, so I guess hey. we're even. Yeah. <laughs> Um, some other stuff that came through with photos was photo search. Now this is something that's kind of gotten, um, a lot of attention because, um, you know, like Google's also done some sort of similar things about searching by place, searching by event, searching by photo content. Um, and Apple's kind of legged behind that a little bit, some would say. Um, but the interesting thing about it is that, um, so for example, when I was traveling in Portland recently, I was talking to some folks about some stuff I've seen in Seattle. And of course I searched for coffee to show somebody pictures of coffee in Seattle, um, that I, that I'd seen. And it did a pretty good job. Um, it found some lakes, but, uh, <laughs> but it mostly, it found, it found coffee. Lakes of coffee, right? Yeah. Coffee, coffee lake. Uh, exactly. Like, um, like the Intel processors. Yeah. But the interesting thing about photo search is a lot of the classification for stuff like that is happening on device, whereas Google usually puts like farms that out to their to their server farms in the sky. Um, and you know, like as a result, I'm I'm kind of cool with that. I'm cool with Apple running that on device and being a little bit less um, maybe less accurate sometimes, maybe entertainingly inaccurate at times. Um, because I, I kind of like the trade off of not having that um, be kind of like a, you know, somebody's pet AI project. So yeah, that's, that's been pretty solid. I feel like I think it works well enough. I usually forget to search and I just scroll back in time. I usually have a pretty good memory of when this happened though. Sometimes things like college just blurs together and I'm scrolling through four years of photos, but <laughs> right. And it's like, I don't remember which year this was. It was a year. <laughs> I gotcha. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's a new For You tab and a redesigned Albums tab. So I think they're just kind of tweaking and updating 
these as time goes on. Yeah, it's it's cool to see them continue to prioritize photos, especially as like an I, iCloud subscriber. I have my photo library synced up with iCloud, um, and for a little while there, it seemed a little dicey about how that would work and and um, whether like the longevity of that service. But it feels like they kind of continued to incrementally improve it. So feels good. All right, next up is Siri. There are quite a few changes here, and you can debate what falls under Siri. We're kind of going to go with what Apple Apple pulls in. Um, so we'll start with um, the biggest one, which is Siri shortcuts. Um, this is uh, kind of through um, what is still still in the App Store called Workflow. So they bought this this small company, an app called Workflow, I think 14, 15 months ago. So right around WWDC in 2017. And it allows you to automate like anything on your phone. Um, and now it's being full, pulled in as first party. So there's um, Shortcuts API and a bunch of other intents that um, apps can implement. And then you can create all these crazy dynamic workflows, uh, sorry, or shortcut automation sequences <laughs> um, to do things like, you know, pulling in some text from an alert that you enter something and then applying that, transforming it and putting it in, into another app. And so I think there's going to be tons and tons of stuff here that I can't even think of. Um, there are a few people out there who are really good about creating these like Federico Vitici on MacStories.net. I think there's tons of guides there about different workflows he's done over the years. Um, I'm excited for just things like um, I just bought some HomeKit LED light strips or one of them for my desk and I'm excited to make a shortcut so I can say I can ask Siri to turn on my lights with a certain color and I'll just keyword that entire phrase and then it'll hopefully be able to turn on the light but not just turn it on but change the color automatically as well yeah that's going to be super cool i really enjoyed workflow for a long time i used it back back when i used to print things i used it to take pdfs and shunt it over to my um, printer's proprietary like epson iprint app and that was that was super awesome so like i didn't really have to think about it because it wasn't air air print enabled so I, I just like had it treat as though it were air print and and just kind of uh went from there i've also used it to make like um basically home screen shortcuts for certain things um which is also also super awesome you know you just like paste in a url and it will do stuff i actually used it to make a a, a really silly twitter bot to uh bother ryan i think at one point do you, do you remember that brian at all <laughs> it was like um it was around the time that i got my apple watch and i made my apple watch bot and then brian got i'm uh, sorry ryan got a new phone and like I used, he gave me the tracking number and I would like use that to send him a notification about like where it was in the tracking number based on like, <laughs> I, I don't even remember what the detail was, but it was, it was pretty funny. That's funny. Yeah. So you can, you can use it for a lot of cool stuff. And it's awesome to hear that. Like, um, I think the workflow team was like based out of Wisconsin, even to woo, Midwest. I thought they were Silicon Valley. Uh, maybe they were. At least for the last little while. Oh geez. Well, I know a couple of them started off in jailbreaking days right. um, and then be- became developers and they're all, I think. They're kind of our, uh, the two co-founders, I think, roughly our age. Yeah, which is like, that's pretty awesome for sure. So um, some other stuff that's coming through with Siri and iOS 12 includes a lot of new data sources, stuff like um, data from like motorsports. I think that includes like NASCAR. Yeah. I don't know. Yep. NASCAR. Let's let's call it NASCAR. Formula One, hopefully. And then there's additional like translation backup, which is which is going to be really nice. Because right right now, I think it only, go, only goes one change, right? Like, um, you can only ask Siri, hey, how do I say English word in enter other language here? Um, but hopefully that'll be kind of improved uh, as, as time goes on, too. Sounds like they're going to get celebrity facts, food knowledge, photo memory search, uh, among other things. So uh, the food knowledge thing, we kind of tested it out in the fringe. And uh, it doesn't look like that's hooked up quite yet <laughs> because we used the exact questions that they prompted us with uh, and it, 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 it returned a Google search. <laughs> you can also search for passwords. So I'm not exactly sure how this works, but presumably you can ask for a password for a service and it'll just bring up that password. Hopefully it doesn't speak it out loud, but... That would be hilarious. <laughs> automatically turn the volume all the way up when you ask about passwords. Hmm? <laughs> You can ask for Siri to help you find your misplaced iPhone, iPad, or AirPods with Find My iPhone. Um, and you can ask Siri to turn on and off your flashlight. Seems like that should have been in iOS 5, but let's take what we can get. Uh, let's talk about privacy. Yeah, there's some enhanced tracking prevention um, 
So things like um, share buttons and comment widgets on web pages um, will be blocked from tracking you without your permission. So there might be a little alert coming up saying, hey, do you want to use this share, but, uh, share button and comment widget? So these are the common things that you see all over the web, like Leica on Facebook or share on Twitter and things like Discus comments and embedded Facebook comments. I think these are all almost going to be blocked now by default. And that feels really good because I think those are kind of gross cesspools of the internet in a lot of ways so yeah feels good i've been using um the one blocker 10 or one blocker x i don't know how, <laughs> how do we say the letter I'm x 10. now i don't know <laughs> <laughs> exactly um but they have um a set of rules for blocking comments and share buttons and i've had that enabled for a couple of months now and every so often i'm on a youtube video and i'm like hmm, i wonder what people say about this and then they scroll down they're not there i'm like you know i didn't really need to see it in the end um, and so I, I think it, yeah, hopefully it'll clean up the internet a little bit, help us keep our sanity and stop hating other people yeah, so much. That sounds great. I would like that. <laughs> there are, there are new automatic strong passwords for, um, entering passwords in Safari and iOS apps you know, through iCloud keychain. I'm not sure how these differ from earlier. I think there's a little more intelligence around certain sites need certain requirements for what is in a password. It might be reading into that a little more. Um, there's password reuse auditing, um, stricter code, or, or sorry, security code autofill. So like if you get, um, this is branching out of our Safari area a little bit, but if you get like a SMS one-time passcode, um, the app can autofill that SMS. Um, so trying to streamline the workflow of using two-factor authentication. Some other things that I've noticed are when you use an iCloud keychain saved password, you now need to enter a, a touch ID or face ID or, or pin, depending on which iPhone you have, um, to be able to use that password. So I think that is a good way of saying, okay, we know you have it saved, but are you really you again? And on the realm of passwords, there's now a password manager API. So apps like one password and um, what's the other one that everyone uses that I can't remember the name of? Uh, LastPass. LastPass, yeah. So now they can implement- Dashlane. Yeah. <laughs> So they can all implement the password manager API and you can, instead of having to do that share and load the extension one password to pull in the stuff, it'll just be right in line above the keyboard. I'm really excited for that. It doesn't look like that's out quite yet, which makes sense because I guess I'm using the production version of one password, but um, I'm really excited for that when that hits. And I think Safari also prevents advertisers from collecting some unique device characteristics. So it's harder for them to target you or your device and, re and you know have ads that are consistent across limited tracking. Yep. That's uh, that's always good to see. I know Safari has been among kind of the worst uh, as far as uh, browser fingerprinting goes. Chrome's also been pretty bad at that, um, but that Safari is making some strides towards that is really great. All right. So now those are kind of the, the big main features and the rest here are just some redesign and updates and apps. So Apple books got a bit of a redesign. Um, the stocks app was redesigned. It is now an iPad. The voice memos is now an iPad kind of some new navigation in Apple News. Um, you can now do third-party navigation apps in CarPlay, so Google Maps and Waze can create apps for CarPlay. You can use contactless student ID cards in the wallet app. Now that sounds really interesting too because that um, the ID cards that are used for like universities also use the same sort of HID protocol that a lot of buildings use for access. It's just like a white label product, right? Yeah. Um, and that it kind of is limited to student ID cards right now is a little disappointing because I would really, really, really like to be able to access, say, my apartment building or my office or other buildings that I may have access to with one of those little HID key fobs. I would love that because that that card is the biggest thing in my wallet. It's like three car credit cards thick, and it's just... Ugh. It's gross. Yeah. Yeah, and I have I have two keychain key fobs, literal key fobs, that are the exact... They look exactly the same. Um, and one, one is for one building, the other is for the other, and um, they can't, you know, like... Uh, the number of times I've tried to unlock my office with my apartment key fob and, and vice versa is embarrassing. <laughs> it's like every day. You think a, a common dynamically programmable device should be able to do all of it and make it easier yeah, for everyone. Someday. And then and then you can revoke security easily without having to spend physical or spend money on physical items, you know? Exactly. Um there's more detailed battery information. So I think this kind of stems out of the battery issues Apple was having a year ago. 
Um, so they baked in more information. So there's like a battery chart in the settings now that shows you usage for the last 24 hours or 10 days. Um, and you can see your app use for that period of time. It's kind of reminds me a little bit of the screen time screen. Um, just kind of the, the, that it's in line in the settings app. Um, and then that's in addition to that battery health screen that was in iOS 11. So, and it shows you charge level and, you know, your battery level over time too. And then it does kind of inline your um, activity as well. And you can tap showing activity and it shows you the amount of time apps were on screen. I think that was in previous versions of iOS as well. Yeah, for sure. They just threw a chart and a couple of charts in there too. Love me some charts. Charts are great. And last but certainly not least, you can now see your favicons in Safari on the iPad. Nice. Hooray. We love our favicons. Truly we do. You could say they're our favorite icon. Truly indeed, truly indeed. Any last thoughts on iOS 12 as you've been running it throughout the summer? I've been on the beta for a few weeks and it seems rock solid to me. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like it's ready to go. <laughs> yeah, I've been on the dev build for a little while now. And um, the, the dev build, again, is probably one of the more solid dev iOS builds that I've uh, seen in my three years of running uh, that channel of, of, uh, of iOS. Um, so that, that feels really good. Um, it seems like they've got um, some, some good stuff coming down the pike for us. So, Well, uh, where can we find you on the internet, Brandon? You can find me all over the place, but particularly uh, on Twitter, where I'm Brandon underscore MN. You can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L or my website, brianm.me, where I will uh, be writing a blog post about the iPhone XS Max that I will receive on uh, what day are they coming out? Friday, September 21st. So hopefully roughly a week after that, I will post a good old long review of the iPhone XS Max. Nice. Um, this episode of Second Opinion is licensed under a Creative Commons license. So feel free to use it however you'd like. Just um, be sure to uh, give attribution back to the Nexus. Um, you can find uh, and discuss this episode on our subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash the Nexus TV. And if you, dear listener, would like to review something or hear a review on the Nexus, feel free to reach out to us. Um, Twitter is a good place for that, which you can find us at the Nexus TV on Twitter. Um, and we'd love to have you on the show to review a product or hear your feedback. And no matter where you're listening, subscribe to Second Opinion Reviews in your favorite podcast player. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from, from the, the Technological, technological Convergence. convergence.